Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the care of your people, turning us from our sins to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sins, receive forgiveness, and draw into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. first reading is from the 30th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God and walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your hearts turn away, and you do not hear, but are led astray, and bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life 
so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. second reading is from the third chapter of the first book of Corinthians. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now, you still are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Serving through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos, watered, but God gave the growth. So neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will, re will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. To Saint Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to, to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, 
be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it, that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, take the words that I am to speak and by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit, use them, I pray, to speak your word to all of us gathered faithfully before you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Well, both on my call sermon Sunday in mid-November and this my first Sunday with you, we certainly have some challenging gospel texts. <laughs> it may be a theme. It is good to be here. Uh, let me start by saying that. It's been quite a journey last Sunday at this time. We were, my friend and I and my oldest cat, about two hours to the east of uh, middle, the middle of West Virginia. We stayed near Charleston uh, that night and on our way here. And I'm still a little discombobulated and in boxes everywhere. And don't shudder when you see the church office. It's filled with boxes. Um, but it is good to be in your midst and to be getting settled and to share in this worship service with you. Thank you. 
Thank you for calling me to be in your midst and for welcoming me today. I snuck downstairs before the service to grab a little bite of fruit uh, to elevate my blood sugar, and I st saw the stunningly beautiful cake that is sitting on the table. Thank you. I hope someone can get a picture. <laughs> I do look forward to getting to know each and every one of you. And I deeply, deeply appreciate all the energy and preparation that has gone into this day. Over the last several days, every time I was here in the building in this nave, Craig was working on the sound and the lights and the visual recording system. He was working tirelessly. And it was wonderful to see him and see Judy and now see Mohammed and see so many who are working with him, making sure that we are brightly lit and the sound system is picking us up and that the recording system is clear so that those who are tuning in via the internet can worship with us in clarity. And I get the impression that that is but one of the many, many such efforts to strengthen the ministry here. And I am so excited to be sharing this, to sh join with you from this day forward. In this season of the growing light, this season of epiphany, we are given a vision of what it means to follow the one who is the light of the world, who calls us together into community so that we might witness to the light. And on this, my first Sunday at Augustana, I'm here to say how good it is to come together in community, to journey together in faith, and to witness together as the body of Christ to the hope that is within us, the love that can and will heal the world. And on this first Sunday in your midst, we began with our first reading by hearing the final sermon from one of our forerunners in the faith. Moses, who can see the promised land, but knows that the people will reach it without him. Here in Deuteronomy, his farewell address to the people Israel, Moses uses to sum up his most important message from his entire leadership with them. He says, choose life by loving God and walking the path of God's commandments. The other way is death. The clarity of his message is striking. It's a simple choice, life or death, blessing or curses, follow God or be led astray. In the face of such clarity, I find myself asking, why would anyone choose anything other than the path of life? Why would people even be tempted to bow down to other gods when the choice is so clear? What causes people to turn away to lies rather than following the truth? It's a question with new urgency in this fraught time in our public life. And I know that I heard this familiar text with new ears when I reread it in my sermon preparation. In fact, and I wonder if this is true for you as well, I find myself over and over again in recent days hearing familiar words of scripture and of liturgy in whole new ways. I am hungry for a word that comes from beyond the limits of human brokenness. And I'm hungry for it in a deeper and newer way in this time. 
And the word we get this morning is sharp, as I mentioned at the beginning. It's a tough Sunday to preach Lutheran grace, which is what I tend to preach. In this gospel today, Jesus sharpens the commandments that he has inherited from his Jewish tradition. He is showing that it is not just a matter of outwardly obeying the commandments, as the rabbis before him would have said as well. But he sharpens it, showing that it's, it's a matter of the heart. It is a matter of inner assent to those commandments. Yet anyone who knows the human heart knows that such inner ascent can be far more challenging than following outward rules. In other words, it's complicated, as various social media might say. It's complicated, and much of it seems to be out of our control. The reality is, much of the time, we do not see with the clarity that Moses declares in our first reading today. And our brokenness, our sin, gets in the way of listening to the truth and following the way of life. This is true individually and perhaps even more glaringly so as a people, as humanity, as a society, as a culture. I know that I have been in repeated despair recently at our current situation where the moral choice often seems crystal clear, yet we as a culture, as a society, keep choosing the other path. I believe that we need the wisdom of previous generations. I believe that we have inherited in these commandments a gift. Perhaps I am uniquely positioned to say that growing up in a half-Jewish family where on the day of Simchat Torah we raise the Torah scrolls and carry them in procession around the sanctuary and people sing out with joy at the gift of the law. It's not something we talk about in the Lutheran church in quite the same way. And let me be clear, this gift comes to the people Israel. This gift comes to us after God first says to us, I love you and you are my people. This gift comes to us to help us to live together in community. So over the years, let me tell you a story. Over the years, one of my great delights has been to teach young and older teenagers in confirmation class. I love teaching confirmation. And when I'm on the unit where we start talking about the Ten Commandments, but I haven't told them this is where we're going yet. And this started well before Survivor was ever on television, but it's sort of the same idea. I'd say to the class, okay, let's pretend that we've been on some sort of boat or plane or whatever, and we've ended up on this island together. We're all okay. We're all okay physically, but now we're going to need to live here together. What do you think we should do first? So we talk our way through shelter and stuff to eat and all those fun things. And then I say, now, are there going to be any, like, rules for how we're going to live together? Well, these are 13, 14, and 15-year-old youth. They said, nope, nope, rules, done with rules. We don't need rules. I want to get away from all those rules. I said, oh, good. Okay, so you've just gone out. And you've gotten that coconut off that tree and you brought it into your little shelter there. I'm just going to come into your shelter and take it because I'm hungry too. And then they look at each other and they say, oh, okay, so we should have a rule that says no stealing. You can't steal. So we talk our way through it. And yes, I do a little bit of leading in that conversation, but it's remarkable to me how class after class, year after year, wise young person after wise young person ends up coming up with something awfully close to the list of the Ten Commandments. 
And they recognize in that conversation that we're doing this not to make God love us. They already have studied the Apostles' Creed for usually the past half a year. They know that we believe in one God who came to us in Jesus Christ and loves us with a love that will never let us go. No, we are saying we need these commandments so that we can live with one another and so that we can reflect the light and love that we have been given by God. And because on our own, we might just mess up without some wisdom to guide us. These rules, these commandments, this sharpening of the commandments that Jesus gives us today are not about following what God has set down in a decree to get with a spiritual program or to make God love us. No, for God first loves us and calls us to love one another in reflection and response. Ultimately, this gift and this sharpening of the gift by Jesus is about being in community and about wanting what's best for our neighbor. A life centered in the self. A life about nothing beyond me, myself, and I. A life, as Luther would say, curved in on the self, in curvados in se, which was his definition of sin, is a life of emptiness and that spreads its emptiness to everyone around. I think we are seeing that very clearly right now. Such a life is not a life of following God. Instead, quite the opposite. The Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition before us calls us to give ourselves away for others, to seek the best for our neighbor, not to use them, not to see them as an object. People are not objects in our inner or outer drama. I wondered if when I said that, I'm simply preaching to the converted this morning, because I think you get that. In reading about you before I ever met you, and talking with the call committee and the council, and talking to so many of you when I was here in November, I know that you, that we now, are people of good heart and deep intentionality, and we get that the Christian life is about turning ourselves inside out for others. Yet the needs of those others can be so overwhelming, can't they? The daily onslaught of desperation of bad decisions that are making things decidedly worse for the most vulnerable among us, the gaping needs that surround us, all of that can feel impossible to deal with. I don't know how many of you are like me, and sometimes I open my Facebook and I'm just like, oh my goodness gracious, where do we even begin? If we feel that we are called to meet those needs? Where do we even begin? If we are already doing our best, how in the world would we add one more thing? And is there any more room for rest, for joy, and for self-care? All right, I've got one answer to that. We're not the Savior. Thanks be to God. We we are not the Savior. There is only one who saves, whose grace pouring into us makes us whole. There is only one whose power working in us can do more than we can ask or even imagine. And thanks be to God, this one has given us to one another, called us into community, into his body together so that none of us does this work alone. In fact... Paul has some rather strong words today about seeing any one fallible human being, any leader of the community, as anything other than a servant of the Holy One, the Holy One, 
who gives the energy and the growth that sustains us all. It's a comfort to me on this first morning with you to know that I am simply one servant in a line of pastors pictured up on the wall next to the church office, called into this community of Augustana Lutheran Church with all of you fellow servants of Christ, and that together we are sustained by a love that will not let us go, a grace that makes us whole, a new life that is already transforming the world. I look forward to being about the work of the gospel with you and to nurturing a community where we can come each and every one of us in all of our human brokenness and find in each other welcome partners in the path of new life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We believe
called to be a light to the nations. Let us pray for God's justice, peace, and healing. Holy Lord, you alone are God. Remove jealousy and quarreling between Christian denominations. Hold us in the unity of our baptism as we work together to serve you. Lord, in your mercy. All bountiful Lord, you called into being the first fruits of the earth. Guide gardeners and farmers who till the soil and tend the fields. Bless their work and in due season bring forth the bounty of the land. Let us work together to make right your wondrous creation where neglect and abuse of use leave it damaged and unclean. Let your purifying light shine throughout all the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, your love knows no bounds. Break down barriers caused by nationalism. Challenge our stereotypes. Give us courage to engage in difficult conversations with those whose experiences are different from our own. Endow leaders at all levels the knowledge and power to see your love reflected in their action and deeds. Lord, in your mercy. All giving, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on those who struggle in great need. Alex Dunkel, Betsy Fulford, Paul Knight, Chuck Leith, and Trevor Peters. Ease the pain of families affected by divorce. Grant life-giving work to those who seek employment. Surround our Augustana brothers and sisters with your healing grace and love, especially Betty Anderson, Bob Anderson, Mariando, Paul Beto, Thomas Beers, Randall Bow, Novella Bradley, Edith Briggs, Warren Briggs, Alex and Olivia Brown, Carol Capps, Pearl Cox, Herman Davis Jr., Diane Durbin, Laura Gertz, Heidi Hansen, David Hatfield, Ruth Hunter, Renee Ivory, Eric Latimus, Ingrid Margrave, Austin Miller, Margaret Mushala, Graciela Reyes, Anna and Hermaine Rodriguez, Diane Schilke, Mary Schooley, Craig Shireman, Norma Cibrian, Joy Stansel, Nicole Wade, Shadonna Whitaker, Al, Deborah, Mike, and Tracy Young, and Carol Fazzetti. Be a constant presence in the lives of our family and friends, Sophia Chin, Sarah Coates, the Froelichstein family, Ruth Fox, Russ Fulford and family, David Fife, Rita Glenn, the Goff family, Joan Francis, Will Harper, Blanche Harrington, Larise Juggins, John Leith, and all those we name before you or hold close in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. All seeing, Lord, you know every hair on our heads, yet we do not even know each of our neighbors. Equip this assembly to know the people in our community and to serve their needs in every way, surrounded by your grace and love. Lord, in your mercy. All providing, Lord, illuminate the ministry of Pathy, Pastor Kathy Rosenholtz as she enters her way in the life of Augustana. May the Holy Spirit guide and assist her as she leads us and guide and assist us to fully participate in her service to you. Be present with all the leaders in your church 
especially our bishops, Elizabeth and Richard, so your light shines in and through us in service to you. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, you are the God of our ancestors in faith. You are our God. Keep us faithful until we join all saints in the brilliance of your church triumphant. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share that peace.
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all the nations in the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son, and in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending give you thanks, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you sent in this end of the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim your will. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you created all things and in whom you take delight. He is your word, sent from heaven to a virgin's womb. He there took on our nature and our lot and was shown forth as your Son, born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. He, our Lord Jesus, fulfilled all your will and won for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands in suffering in order to free from suffering those who trust in you. He is the one who handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death, to break the bonds of the evil one, to crush hell underfoot, to give light to the righteous, to establish his covenant, and to show forth the resurrection. Taking bread and giving thanks to you, said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we take this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine and fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith and truth that we may praise and glorify you through, our, through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forevermore.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in grace. us all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. 